The only thing we can be sure of about the future is that it will be absolutely fantastic. Five, four, three, two, one. My name is Jenna Eigenbrode. I'm a scientist at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, and I was here to talk about the discovery of organic matter on Mars. I always loved science when I was in school. I think it was even middle school that I liked science classes, and it really was just sort of fostered by my family and friends uh, to not stop asking questions. I think my mom was pretty patient with me when I asked why all the time. Um, one day I came home and tried to explain the weather, or at least predict it based on the clouds. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> um, you know, I've always been kind of fascinated with nature, and science really just stuck with me. But at the same time, I also loved art. I've always liked painting and making things, and uh, for a long time I thought I was going to explore uh, an art career. And at some point I realized that to be the scientist I wanted to be, I had to apply my creativity to science instead. And since then I've realized that the imagination that's needed to understand and discover things is pretty astounding. And other people with it always amaze me. So there's as much creativity in science as there ever has been in art, I would say. So. I think I made the right choice. Imagination to me is thinking of things that we haven't thought about before. Uh, some people would say thinking outside the box of what we're familiar with. Um, imagining something that's so different than what we have ever seen or anyone else has ever showed us in their own imagination. It's something new. It's kind of its own discovery, but it's very personal. But in science, you ground it in data. You have to actually have observations that change your perspective of something. And you've got to imagine what that data means. And when you come up with an idea of how to explain the data using your imagination, that's the hypothesis. That's the next one we go to explore and, and test. And then the new results come in and they inform us about something, and then you use your imagination to figure out the bigger picture. What does that mean? The next hypothesis is generated. This is how science evolves. This is how we've gone from understanding one small bit of the world and other worlds to having a better understanding of the whole thing. Mars is a red planet. And it's seemingly inactive, at least from a distance. And there's all this evidence that suggests that things were active on the planet at one point. We knew all of this, or at least this was the general perspective before Curiosity landed. And then we're, we landed and we're driving along and we find this rock that has a whole bunch of smaller pebbles in it and they're rounded and they're different sizes. And our first thought was, oh, we found a conglomerate that is deposited from a river, something we find on Earth all the time. But we had to take a couple steps back. We're like, wait a second. Are we sure there was water? Is water what moved those rocks and what rolled them and turned them into rounded little pebbles? Something had to take an angular rock, something with sharp edges, and knock them all off to make rounded pebbles. There's a whole bunch of different sizes. What process made that? And we kind of went back and reviewed the actual physics of different types of materials and media that might actually create this to make sure that our river matched up with that. <laughs> because the processes that were happening on Mars may not have been the same as what we had on Earth. So we had to like kind of go back to first principles. How did we figure out on Earth that a conglomerate was made by a river in river processes. Let's do the same on Mars. Okay, what, what did it take to do that? And did we arrive at the same conclusion? We did. But we had to go back to first principles and make sure we understood all of that before we could be confident in that conclusion. 
And then it was, oh my gosh, there was rivers on Mars. OK, just think about that for a moment. We are on a red planet. And we had evidence of a river on Mars for the first time. Wow, talk about fueling your imagination. What is today is not was in the past. It was something completely different. And then when we drilled into the rocks and we found gray material and realized there's just red dust everywhere. It's this rust that's all this iron rust. The whole planet's not red. That's just the surface. There's something else hidden underneath all of that. And we're still figuring out what that is. And I think, I think that is absolutely fascinating because it challenges a lot of our science, scientific understanding. Those rocks are gray. And parts of them turned red later. So what's the story for the gray rock that's all over the place? What is that? That's what we're going to keep exploring and find out. I helped to um, put SAM in the operation and figure out processing of the data so that we can interpret it. One of the big things that I did was um, when I first got to Goddard, I was asked to help figure out how do we calibrate the instrument once we get to Mars. And there's this little cell on it. It's actually no bigger than the tip of my thumb, kind of like the size of a thimble. And in that, we have a combination of gases and organic molecules. And I had to figure out what to put in there as a calibrant for all of the different types of experiments we intended to do. And I had come from academics. I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> Here I was engineering something that was critical for the science. But I tell you. Um, when the rover launched from Cape Canaveral, and you're looking at this giant rocket, and the very, very tippy top has the rover in it. You can barely see the tippy top. And there's a rover. And inside the rover is the SAM instrument. Inside the SAM instrument is this little thing <laughs> that's like this big. I worked on that, and it left Earth. And I'll tell you, that is the coolest thing. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that was a very special moment. And then we used it once we got to Mars. And it was very important for a lot of the work that we did. The biggest surprise was discovering that there was evidence of macro molecules made of carbon. These are big molecules. Most all natural organic matter that we find anywhere, whether it's Earth, biology, in meteorites, most of it is macromolecules. But we didn't really expect, not everyone expected to find any evidence of organic matter at the surface of Mars. But to find evidence of macromolecules gives us a clue as to how they were preserved and actually lasted the three and a half billion years since they were deposited, and all of the radiation that happened over tens of millions of years, which destroys organics. When we started this mission, most of the people on the science team did not think we were actually going to find evidence of organic matter. Not in the samples that we were collecting. So to find what we did really makes us all do a about turn and changes our understanding of what's possible. Especially when we think about what we might study in the future. If there's organic molecules preserved at the surface, there most certainly must be organic molecules preserve deeper down. And they probably preserve the information that we seek. What's it from? Is it from a meteorite? Is it from geology? Is it from biology? That's the next big question. There's so much momentum behind this endeavor. It's international. There's so many people who want to see it happen. It almost has a life of its own. It's going to happen. So we are working towards, NASA is working towards making that happen. There's a lot of questions that come with that, including science questions. And so I'm, I'm very eager to help formulate what science we will do before we send humans and once humans are there.
The only thing we can be sure of about the future is that it will be absolutely fantastic. Five, four, three, two, one.